Dinosaurs roam the Earth for over 160 million years. The dinosaurs were pretty stupid and they couldn't even build spaceships. So when an asteroid came careening towards Earth 65 million years ago, they had no way to redirect that shit. One giant crater in the Yucatan Peninsula later and the dinosaurs got completely extinct. What a bunch of losers. I mean, at least all the cool dinosaurs had anyway. The rest just turned into modern day birds. Disappointing, we know. But this wasn't the first mass extinction event that the Earth has been faced with. It was actually the fifth one. While it's hard to say with absolute certainty what happened 445 million years ago, all evidence points to the other four mass extinctions being caused by a volcano, a volcano, a volcano, and you guessed it. It was a volcano. And note here that we say a volcano rather than volcanoes, because each extinction event has been linked to a single volcanic event rather than a global upwelling of volcanic activity. Until the 150 kilometer wide Chicxulub impact crater was found in Mexico, it was even believed the volcano was responsible for the death of the dinosaurs. As well. The good news is the majority of volcanoes in the world are extinct. In general, a volcano is considered extinct if it hasn't erupted in over 10,000 years, though many of those are still labeled as dormant or inactive rather than actually extinct. For example, the Yellowstone Cal era hasn't erupted in over 600,000 years, but it is known to only be dormant rather than extinct. There are believed to be millions of extinct volcanoes, but many of them are on the ocean floor, so nobody's really bothered trying to count them, which is kind of terrifying. Look, when it comes to what we consider active volcanoes, there are about 1,500 on land and an indeterminate amount underwater. We know there are at least 5,000 active underwater volcanoes, but since the vast majority of the ocean is still unexplored, we haven't even come close to getting a final tally. So, if a single volcano is able to cause a mass extinction event, what would happen if every volcano on Earth erupted at once? Now, it's important to remember that not all volcanic eruptions are created equal. Between 10 and 20 volcanoes erupt every single day, but they have yet to wipe out humanity. Perhaps you remember the eruption of Mount Urugongo. Definitely don't remember how to pronounce it in the Congo in 2021. The eruption claimed the lives of 32 people and destroyed over a thousand homes. This is what's referred to as a magnitude one or gentle eruption on the volcanic explosivity index, also called the VEI. The VEI is a logarithmic scale that judges the magnitude of any given eruption based on the amount of tephra ejected from the volcano. Tephra is a sort of catch-all term for all of that sh** that gets spewed out of a volcano regardless of its size or composition. A magnitude 1 on the VEI means there was 10,000 cubic meters of tephra ejected from the volcano. Those daily eruptions are usually a magnitude 0, which is anything less than 10,000 cubic meters. Because the VEI is logarithmic, each increase in magnitude on the VEI scale corresponds to an increase by an order of magnitude of the amount of tephra, or at least it should. But a VEI 2 is categorized as explosive and is actually 100 times more powerful than a VEI 1. Each subsequent step is 10 times more powerful, and that extra jump from 1 to 2 may just have been because they ran out of descriptive adjectives. As you get higher on the scale, the effects obviously become a whole lot more devastating. For example, take the most famous volcanic eruption in history, the Mount Vesuvius eruption in 79 AD, which destroyed Pompeii. Pyroclastic flows tore through the city at speeds exceeding 100 km an hour, leaving behind thousands of dead, many of whom are preserved as ash mummies. The VI ranks that eruption as cataclysmic, but even with over one cubic kilometer of tephra, it was only a magnitude 5 eruption. There is theoretically no upper bound to the scale, though there is no evidence of eruption ever exceeding a magnitude 8. They also ran out of good descriptive adjectives after cataclysmic, as VEI 6, 7, and 8 are categorized as colossal, super colossal, and mega colossal. Fortunately, most volcanoes aren't even capable of producing a VEI 8 eruption. At that scale, there needs to be over 1,000 cubic kilometers of ash and debris flung into the air with the vertical column of ejected tephra reaching as high as 50 kilometers that's halfway to outer space volcanoes capable of producing magnitude 8 eruptions such as the yellowstone caldera are referred to as super volcanoes now of course that's more of a media invention rather than a scientific classification but it is somewhat useful for our purposes today there are about 20 known super volcanoes so for every volcano erupted at the same time there could be 20 vei8 eruptions in addition to all of the smaller ones though of course smaller is still a relative term here, and even a VEI-7 eruption can have serious global impacts. 
All right, so the most powerful volcanic eruption ever in recorded history was the eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815. It ejected nearly 50 cubic kilometers into the stratosphere, including large quantities of sulfur dioxide that was capable of reflecting sunlight back away from the planet. Although Mount Tambora was located on an island in Indonesia, it was large enough of an eruption to cause major effects across the globe that lasted for years. Sunlight across the world was reddened and dimmed by the massive cloud covering the atmosphere making days seem like an endless sunset. The lack of sunlight was obviously bad for crops that needed the light to photosynthesize, and things only got worse the following year. The Northern Hemisphere referred to 1816 as the year without summer. It had been over a year since Mount Tambora erupted the previous April, but the effects were still being felt. With sunlight blocked out, the global temperatures had fallen by an average of 0.5 degrees Celsius. Now, that might not sound like a huge amount, but that is the global average resulting from something that was only predominantly impacting one hemisphere. The changes were were also going to be felt more heavily the further away from the equator someone was located, like the vast agricultural areas of North America. That change in temperature meant that the last frost was pushed back from late April all the way to June, with some snowfall even being reported that very month. Even once temperatures had raised enough to allow planting crops, the reduction in sunlight remained a problem. Even if crops did begin to grow, they were often killed off by the highly acidic rain, resulting from all of the gases that Tambora had launched into the atmosphere. While only about 10,000 deaths directly attributed to the eruption itself, another a hundred thousand people died as a result of the famine that it caused. These global climate changes and the resulting deaths were all caused by just that one volcano. And again, that was only a magnitude seven. What about something bigger? Like the largest volcanic event in all of known history. So our planet is constantly trying to kill us with natural disasters, and as they say, the third time is the charm. The Permian Triassic extinction event, better known as the Great Dying, was the third and most severe of the five major extinction events. It wiped out up to 90% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial species. The scientific consensus is that it was caused by major volcanic activity in Siberia, but it's not quite like the eruptions that we've discussed so far. The Great Dying wasn't the result of a singular massive eruption, but rather hundreds of thousands of years of basalt lava leaking out of the Siberian volcanoes. The flood basalt covered an area of 2 million square kilometers, which is roughly the size of Saudi Arabia. That's almost half a percent of the total land mass of our planet, completely covered in lava from a single volcanic event, even if it was one that lasted a very long time. Now, obviously, the torrent of lava was going to kill everything in its path, but there were many more ways that this resulted in the extinction of species. Oh, one of the biggest factors was the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that were pumped into the atmosphere. It's estimated that as much as 12,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide Oxide were added to the atmosphere, which had two disastrous effects. Now, the first of those was acid rain. This acidified the oceans and increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the water. Now, because carbon dioxide is much more soluble in water than oxygen is, changes in its levels have a much larger effect. Even if the increased acidity of the water didn't kill the marine life, the increased levels of carbon dioxide could cause infertility and many birth defects. It also meant that there was a lower concentration of oxygen in the water, which of course was devastating for a marine life with less developed response respiratory systems. On land, the acid rain was also deadly. It could kill plants as well as some animal species, and the increased acidity of rainfall resulted in a higher rate of erosion. There were certain types of animals, like specific species of worms, that could metabolize the acidic elements in the soil, but as they died off, it started to create a positive feedback loop. The soil became more acidic, resulting in more plants dying off, which meant less carbon dioxide was being removed from the atmosphere, resulting in higher levels of acid rain. And then, of course, there was the greenhouse effect. The sky was filled with carbon dioxide oxide, sulfur, and methane, causing the temperature of the planet to rise dramatically. Before the Great Dying, the global average surface temperature was 18 degrees Celsius. During this event, the temperature rose to 35 degrees Celsius. As a basis for comparison, the current global surface temperature is about 14. But again, while this was a volcanic event, it wasn't really what we think of as an eruption. This is closer to the level of devastation that we could expect if all the world's volcanoes erupted at once, but the reality of that situation would be worse. It would be much worse. Now, even though science has assured us that this is unlikely to the point of being impossible, let's now look at exactly how bad it would be if all of the world's volcanoes erupted at once, because impossible is kind of what we do here. We're going to assume that they're firing at maximum capacity as well, because, well, why the f not. In reality, not every eruption from a supervolcano will be a VEI-8, but for our purposes, we're going to assume that they absolutely are, because f 
the planet. The ocean uh, would become far more acidic, causing serious damage to marine life. Normally, undersea volcanoes only create a localized drop in pH levels, but normally, we don't have thousands of them erupting at the same time. Even if the underwater eruptions don't completely acidify the oceans, all the acid rain that we can expect absolutely will. Pyroclastic flows will pour out of every volcano, reaching speeds of 700 kilometers an hour, destroying everything in their paths. Hundreds of thousands of cubic kilometers of tephra would be launched into the atmosphere, essentially blocking out the sun. At first, it would be like the year without summer, but a whole lot colder. The Earth would plunge into a whole new ice age. However, these freezing temperatures are likely to be a bit of a short-term problem. While ash and sulfur would block out the sun, eventually the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would create a runaway heating effect like what happened during the Great Dying. But before that could even happen, the lag of sun and the acid rain would cause plants to die off. This would cripple our food production and the entire ecosystem, causing a cascade of extinctions by the species that weren't killed by the absolutely enormous initial eruptions. But maybe you think you can wait it out. Perhaps you have an underground bunker with plenty of planting soil and some grow light so that you can produce your own food while you wait out the global apocalypse. Hopefully, you also have an endless supply of gasoline for your generator because it would take very little time for all the world's power grids to go down. Of course, if you do hope to wait out the initial disaster and try and rebuild society afterwards, some sort of secure underground bunker is probably your best bet. Realistically, you would just be prolonging your own suffering, but I mean, you do you, okay? Anyway, volcanoes fling a lot of crap into the air, much more than just gases. There's also massive amounts of volcanic ash. This isn't like ash from a wood fire or a cigarette butt either. Volcanic ash is made up of rocks, minerals, and glass, and, well, sh that is really heavy. The Yellowstone caldera would fire enough ash into the air that once it started to fall down, it would collapse every roof in Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, and that list just keeps on going. So let's just say it would be about a third of the United States. But that's just the areas getting enough ash to collapse a roof, which is only four inches or about 10 centimeters. Everything within 250 kilometers of the caldera could expect to be covered in over a meter of ash. In addition to collapsing buildings, the weight of the ash would also be enough to down phone and power lines as well. While the cloud of ash wouldn't be thick enough by the time it reached California to collapse buildings, it actually wouldn't really matter. Long before the ash began to fall, every coastal city in the world would likely have been destroyed by a stream of massive pock off tsunamis caused from all of the eruptions and tectonic activity that generally accompanies them. In short, there is virtually no chance the human race could survive such a catastrophe. Every volcano erupting on the planet at once, at full power, would have very real possibility of being Earth's final mass extinction event. The one finally to take out 100% of species. But even if anything survived, the world wouldn't be the same place anymore. Not only would the landscape be forever changed, but even our orientation to the sun would be different. In order for all of these volcanoes, including supervolcanoes, to erupt, it would be moving a tremendous amount of mass from inside the planet right to the surface. This would actually change how the planet itself is balanced. We're currently seeing this already on a much smaller scale. So much groundwater is brought to the surface for irrigation and drinking water that the Earth has actually begun to wobble on its axis. It's a very small wobble, only a few millimeters, but it is detectable. The amount of mass moved by such widespread volcanic activity would have a much larger impact. It's impossible to guess exactly what the final result would be, but something similar happened on Mars a few billion years ago that caused the planet to tilt by 20 to 25 degrees. This would change the relative temperatures and the length of the day and night all over the planet. So look, if every volcano on the planet were to erupt at once, it would be a disaster the likes of which we could only possibly imagine. A mass extinction event along the lines of the Great Dying is probably the best case scenario, with the worst case scenario being the end of life absolutely everywhere. And that's much more likely. Luckily, there is essentially no chance that this could ever happen. While we see an eruption like Mount Tambora every five to a thousand years, a VI-8 eruption only occurs every 50,000 years or more. Having 20 such eruptions simultaneously, along with thousands of smaller ones, is essentially impossible. There are a lot of dooms day scenarios involving the Yellowstone caldera and other supervolcanoes, but realistically, humanity uh, will have killed itself off long before the next magnitude 8 eruption.